it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Allison Gammy. Um, Dr. Gammy is uh, uh, has an amazingly difficult role, I, I would say, at the National Institutes of General Medical uh, Science. Um, in that, uh, she's in in charge of as director of uh, workforce development. Uh, fellowships and and diversity. Uh, so she's trying to fill out what would be like three different roles, I would guess, in, in many places. And uh, she comes to this uh, after having spent uh, quite a number of years uh, at Princeton. Uh, she's trained in molecular biology, and uh, we really appreciate her taking the time to uh, join with us uh, for this and to give us some, uh, you know, overview of what her perspective is on enhancing quantitative uh, education from the NIH perspective on uh, uh, basically the wide range of issues in biomedical science. So, um, Allison, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, please feel free to share your screen, and, and, and thanks. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. I just want to make sure, oops, sorry, that everybody can see. All right. Okay, very good. I'm going to minimize this so I can actually see what I'm... <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm the Director of Training, Workforce Development, and Diversity at NIGMS. And I just wanted to give you a, an overview of some of the things that we're doing, particularly in the um, quantitative computational space. Um, I'll start out with this slide. It's a little um, not that easy to read, but it was a quick snapshot I took today from the dashboard at NIH. And one of the things it shows, you can see on the left that it, um, the gender distribution of individuals who get awards from the NIH. And you can see that um, women have, have get fewer and um, the, the trend is going up, but not at the rate that we would uh, need to catch up anytime soon. And likewise, even worse, on the, the right-hand side, you can see the um, race and ethnicity of the funded researchers at NIH. And um, again, there's been some gains, but for the most part, there are some groups who are uh, particularly underrepresented, including Latina, Latino, um, Black or African-American, and American Indian, Alaska Native um, so these are some of the challenges when you think about trying to, um, to build a workforce. You want to build a strong workforce, but um, there's a real need um, to diversify the workforce. And so we have a number of programs at um, NIGMS that are focused on um, uh, training in general, um, diversity enhancing, as well as um, capacity building. And all told, it's uh, nearly 2,000 different awards across um, the workforce development, diversity, and capacity building um, programs. There are at, uh, 400 institutions across the, the country, including um, the territories, Alaska, Puerto Rico, you can see um, the distribution there. And it's nearly, it's uh, nearly uh, $900 million per year that goes towards these efforts. So this um, next graph shows you the, how the different programs map across the um, career pathway, starting from pre-K to 12 up through um, the faculty level. These are just the programs that NIGMS administers. You can see that some span the entire pathway, some are focused on different stages in the pathway, and others are um, during critical transition points along the way. Um, one of the things, I'm not going to walk you through each program independently, but I'd be happy to take any questions um, you have about them. One of the things that um, we've been doing since I got at NIH, or at NIGMS in particular, is to try to build language into all of our training programs that has similar overarching themes. And the first is to really flip the focus towards the trainees and giving them the types of skills that they need um, to transition to the next step in the pathway. And we strongly encourage using as evidence-informed practices and, uh, as I mentioned, a focus on technical, operational, and professional skills. You can see at the bottom of the slide what we mean by those different skills, and you'll see right there <laughs> in the technical, between the technical and operational are the quantitative and computational skills. Um, we also want to see programs that have aims. So just like a research grant you have and what you want to achieve in that period of time, we ask the same of the training programs, and they should be 
obtainable and measurable um, and really focused on, on what types of um, skills the trainees need. We've also included language that incorporates the importance of rigor and transparency to enhance reproducibility, um, as well as the responsible and safe conduct of research. And we put language about this throughout the entire training program, um, and not just as a little add-on towards the end after um, the, the grants have been, or, or the applications have been scored. Another important change was for all of our training programs, including those that are, are just thought to be the, the sort of flagship NIH programs, we, we have diversity language because we think every program should be a diversity enhancing program. And so now there's language throughout and most importantly, we've made it part of the scored review criteria. So it, it can be score driving um, for an application. We also have an emphasis on mentor training and oversight of the trainee mentor match. Um, and this oversight should be the entire time that the um, individuals are in the program and not just the time that they're on the training grants. Additionally, there's a broad range of careers now that are available to individuals earning biomedical degrees. And we want to make sure that the trainees are um, introduced to these range of, of um, careers, as well as what kinds of um, opportunities they have to gain skills to, transi to transition to the next step. Um, we also ask for strong institutional support, and there's a, a letter that needs to come along with it, and it, it is, is showing that there's a strong institutional commitment. We realize that um, really the dollars go a lot farther if, if it's embedded within an institution that's really committed to research training. And finally, and importantly, we um, ask that all programs evaluate so that they um, continually um, improve their programs. And that's based on data um, and on what works and doesn't work in terms of um, developing new um, programming. So uh, just for this group, I wanted to um, show that we have under the, the exact purpose of the programs to, as I mentioned, teaching the skills and we call out in the funding announcements in particular quantitative and computational approaches. Um, we also have language as you can see towards the end of this um, wording is that we want this um, to really promote inclusive research environments um, so that all people are, um, people from all backgrounds are comfortable and well integrated into the community. All right, this next slide is showing you um, our basic biomedical pre-doctoral T32 programs. So these um, are probably the largest chunk of our portfolio by far. And um, these, these um, training grants go out to the top research institutions in the country to support graduate um, training. And the ones I've highlighted on this slide, we have a bunch of different scientific areas, but the ones that I've highlighted in particular call out quantitative um, skills as part of the, should be part of the programmatic design. And that includes the behavior of biomedical sciences, computational biology, bioinformatics, and biomedical data science, biostatistics, um, molecular biophysics, the pharmacological sciences and systems and integrative biology. Um, we also support the development of um, curriculum that is then available to the broader community. And we've done this in, in several different areas um, in the area of um, rigor and reproducibility. We also have done it with a particular focus on data science um, and um, in particular, uh, how to um, best practices for the responsible conduct of data science research. So these um, are uh, training, there's funds to develop training modules that then, then go on a website um, that is a, we have a portal at NIGMS and it's available to the community so that they can slot in and um, pull that, that um, course content and bring it into their curriculum. So NIGMS spearheaded this, but a number of other institutes and centers are, have joined in on these initiatives. Another um, program that we have is Innovative Programs to Enhance Research Training. And this is to support um, research educational activities that will complement training programs. Um, in particular, there's a focus for uh, courses for skills development. And we have had um, quite a few IPERTs come in um, in particular to focus on 
quantitative computational skills. There's another component to this that's very important and, and that there should be um, mentoring and outreach as part of these um, IPERTs. Sometimes the IPERTs also result in course content that then can be disseminated out to the broader community. We also fund um, meetings, and I'm showing you a few here. A lot have to do some of the major diversity um, meetings for particularly for undergraduates, Abercams and SACNES were the major funder of those. But you can see by some of these other titles here that we fund meetings that are really about um, educational reform. Um, and, and one to just call out here is um, that we've funded ones that foster diversity in biostatistics. Um, that was um, last March. All right, so uh, um, more funding opportunities that are available are in the form of supplements to existing grants. And I hope everybody knows about this program and we'll spread the word. But if anybody has an NIH grant, research grant, they're able to get a supplement that's in addition to the, the budgeted amount of money that will support individuals um, who will uh, contribute to the diversity of the biomedical research workforce. And at NIGMS, we fund across the pathway, including starting from high school all the way up through um, supporting faculty um, sabbaticals as well. And um, you just have to check with each institute and center to see where they fund in the pathway. But um, it's a really fantastic opportunity. And, and basically, it, it, it makes it such that Nobody can be turned away from the lab, a lab for lack of th funds if they're from um, an underrepresented group, for example, because this is a, a fantastic way to, to support individuals. Um, we also, NIGMS supports um, educator initiati initiated innovations. Um, we have, a, I mentioned the training modules that were around more the, of the quantitative sciences, but what we're also doing this time is to have training modules so that um, you can develop um, content to help create safe, inclusive, and supportive research environments. And those applications are due in June, and it would be great if you could spread the word on that. Um, we also supplement our existing training grants in a range of topics, and I've highlighted the ones in bold that are particularly relevant to the quantitative sciences. Um, while some of them are open-ended, for example, skills development and undergraduate curriculum, we've been incredibly um, pleased to see that a lot of places have placed uh, an emphasis on developing curriculum for quantitative and computational um, courses. In particular, the undergraduate one, we just, we just did this last spring, and I think nine out of 10 were um, to develop some kind of quantitative computational courses. Um, another supplement that's all along those lines were for um, summer undergraduate research experiences. So again, if you have an NIH grant and have identified an undergraduate who is interested in doing research, this is, does not have to be um, with a diversity focus. This is just a, a broad range of students from all backgrounds. There are also opportunities for trainees specifically to um, to apply for themselves. And the obvious ones at the pre-doctoral level are the, the classic F awards at NIH. And these are um, different flavors. One is for MD PhDs and, um, or in a dual degree program. And then there's the standard um, pre-doctoral F31. The F31 has um, the, the kind of one that's open to everyone. And then there's the F31 that has a focus on enhancing diversity. There are also postdoctoral and faculty fellowships. The classic for postdocs is the F32. Um, and we also have one for senior fellows in F33 that will support, for example, um, a sabbatical. Early career awards are, they sort of, um, they actually span the pathway. In particular, though, the focus tends to be um, on the transition from postdoc into independence or just early independence. Um, there's so many of these K awards, I, I, it would take the entire um, time to discuss all of them, but I did wanna call just one out in particular, a K-25 that I hope you've heard about. It's specifically, a mentored um, quantitative research career development award. So individuals um, who are 
already trained in the quantitative sciences um, and engineering who then want to move into a health related field, this is, would be a perfect opportunity for them to gain that um, training and career development. Um, I'd like to tell you about a brand new program. I'm very excited. It's taken this long to get it launched. Um, I started when I first got here uh, five years ago to, to get this going. And this is a, it's called Maximizing Opportunities for Scientific and Academic Independent Careers or Mosaic. And it has two parts. One is um, there is a a research education component where we give an award to one of the scientific societies and um, we have we've gone through this phase of this and you can see that the, the societies that are represented here um, and then they get st stood up sort of a little bit early and then um, the other component is the individuals um, come in and apply for a mosaic, what's called K99R00. And that um, is a transition from uh, a mentored kind of postdoctoral phase, um, the K part. And then the R00 is when they move to um, an academic position, they can have a, their first research award, which is the R00. So these um, are individual awards. And one of the things we wanted to do was to build a program that had all of the wonderful qualities of our other training programs, which is additional oversight, additional mentoring, um, helping um, more skill building, filling in gaps for um, different parts of um, their career development. And so they, the, the K99R00s will go through the standard review process where they're, they're reviewed by um, a panel of their peers. And then um, we will then distribute the, the K99R00 scholars out across the societies according to their scientific interests. So they have an affinity group in terms of being individuals who are um, enhancing the diversity of the workforce, but they also have an affinity because they're in similar scientific disciplines. And um, the great news about this is I don't think I have it here, but we have, we have been able to pull on um, almost every institute and center at NIH. So this has turned into a trans NIH um, effort now. And so that's very exciting. Also wanted to tell you about um, our postdoctoral research associate training program. So this is if you know anybody who would like to do research at NIH, um, they can apply for this fellowship. And once again, it provides this wonderful additional layer of training, mentoring. Um, you have a cohort and um, it's a really fantastic program. So please um, reach out to us if you know anybody who's interested in doing a postdoc at NIH. So I have a couple of other initiatives. Um, I can pause there, Let's see how we're doing for time. It seems like we're doing okay, um, but that was really what I had in the, the space of um, training, workforce development, and diversity. Um, should I take a pause for questions or should I just keep going with um, some other NIGMS initiatives? I, I think it might be good to uh, let, let folk, uh, folks uh, ask questions there. I, I, I posted one, but I don't want to take over the discussion here. So, okay. Let me um, just go ahead and stop sharing so I can see the chat. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, so uh, th that question was uh, really about there's been a long history of these programs, and as you pointed out, they, there's now a clear emphasis on on diversity issues as well as the host of other things. Um, and any anything you can say about guidance that has come from the evaluation, which is included now in many of these programs, um, uh, to help, you know particularly for those of us who are concerned about enhancing the quantitative, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, diversity in quantitative fields. Uh, anything you can say about that might be really beneficial to this group. So in terms of, so that is, has the evaluation of led to some general evidence for what works? Okay, yeah, I mean, I think that, yes, we do, we do have reasonable data um, something I didn't mention that we support is um, a research portfolio on interventions that can help increase persistence in biomedical fields. But basically, it kind of translates to STEM fields, honestly. But um, we have to have an emphasis because of, we're NIH on the biomedical fields. Um, 
But some of the things that I kind of threw out there, we definitely know. So early on, um, getting research experiences, and that means authentic research experiences for um, undergraduates, for example, so that they can really get bitten by the bug and um, get excited and then helps, helps them persevere through some of these gateway courses that are pretty brutal um, if you don't have something else to <laughs> look forward to in the future. So early research experiences, for sure, we know. Um, I, I threw out there other things such as cohort models. So there's just strong, so for example, particularly when you have severe underrepresentation, it's incredibly helpful to have affinity groups and that you can draw from people across the campus, for example, but, but bringing people together um, from shared backgrounds has some really positive impact and that you don't feel alone, you don't feel, um, you know, isolated, that you, there are people you can connect with. Um, obviously, mentoring, I think that goes without saying, but honestly, um, we felt as though the data was somewhat lacking. It was, it was kind of this thing that we all had an intuition about, but we didn't really have a strong intuition about the specific components that work and don't work in mentoring. And so we have, um, one of the things that we did was to um, fund research specifically in um, the areas of mentoring and networking. And so those data, that, those um, are ongoing. They're kind of, they're just in their first year of being launched and um, they should be ending, they're, they're gonna be five more, five-year awards total. So um, probably in a few years, we'll start to see some of that data come out. And those, those are part of the diversity program consortium. And so they were specifically designed to, to think about issues of underrepresentation and what might work in those spaces. Um, so yeah, so obviously the mentoring, the cohort models, the um, accountability, the sort of um, not letting having the extra layer of oversight. So you, you don't, you know, one of the hard things about, at least in the biomedical research environment, is a person can transition into a lab and get lost. You know, they, they just, there's no, if the, if the principal investigator's not paying attention or um, there's not a committee saying, how's your progress, how are things going, you can, you can really lose people. And so having, when you have, when we have these training programs where there's somebody's looking out for them on top of the structures that are in place, um, that's extremely helpful. And then, I mean, I think that the obvious thing is just a sort of focus towards skills rather than this idea of brilliance or um, talent. We have to get away from using these kinds of words like brilliant and talented and because those um, there's a lot of data that shows those, those titles, those um, superlatives get put more on men than women and underrepresented individuals. And so when you start saying, well, you, you know, that really what it takes to make it is, and I would say this is true in the quantitative sciences in particular, there's a brilliance factor. Um, and so you have to just change the culture away from that to the one of, you know, hard work, skill building, you know, that it's not really just about whether or not you're one of the anointed ones, because as we know, women and underrepresented minorities are going to be sort of um, pushed out of that. So I'm, I'm kind of going on and on and on. <laughs> oh, this is, this is wonderful. I, you know, this is exactly what, what I, I think this group needs to, needs to hear. Okay. And, and maybe there's follow-ups from, from others on this. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I could keep going and going and going, but yes, oh. the answer, short answer is yes. There's a lot of data about what works um, and what kinds of things we can do specifically to intervene and, and try to um, change culture. So. Okay. Yeah. If, if you had a, a summary article on those points that you just mentioned, for example, yeah, um, is there one that you could recommend maybe or just send to us? Um, that's a good um, question. I don't know if there's just one. And so maybe that's something um, we can suggest to some of our um, grantees who work in this space that they might like to write a review article. But um, it's just kind of it's sprinkled around a lot of different um, studies and analysis. But, oh, oh, yeah. Got it. Um, so so. are there specific opportunities for quantitative scientists to start an experimental lab? So I think that the, probably um, the best one that I would go with is this mentored K25 um, where uh, you get, you, you kind of ramp up your experimental skills. And so that um, I think that makes you in particular more um, attractive in terms of um, 
a faculty position where they would then give you startup funds to sort of get a lab going. Um, but it's, there's not, you know, not, not there's not, uh, for example, a um, research grant that is specifically for a startup of um, quantitative, other than that, I mean, that's the one. And I think for the mentored one, you don't, you can actually already have a, a faculty position. So I don't think you have to um, be a, a postdoc for that. Okay, somebody, uh, Holly had a K-25 and is happy to chat with anyone interested. That's fantastic. That would be great. Um, what do you recommend to researchers in states that do not support affirmative action in terms of recruiting and supporting a diverse? Okay, <laughs> I live in this space all the time, right? I am at the I am in the federal government, and um, I don't know about you whether you heard about the recent executive order. We are constantly under have to be super, super, super careful, and so I, you might not. I have I have learned to speak in such a way where I say things like um, enhance the diversity of the biomedical research workforce. We can give examples of diversity, but we can't ever target a specific group or groups. We can just say, we can talk about underrepresentation, and that obviously includes women in the quantitative sciences, I think at all, at all levels, not just at the faculty level. Um, and so, if you're careful with the language, you can get away with it because you're not excluding anybody. I'll give you the example of the mosaic. We have them write a diversity statement that talks about their previous commitment to diversity and their future plans. Now, that anybody can come in with that, right? They come in with that statement and then the review panel looks at it and they say, hmm, this just seems a little bit formulaic, it doesn't, or it sounds aspirational, like they've not really done anything in the past. And, you know, they can start to, to get around it and they can, um, you know, make decisions that, that are helpful in that regard, even without knowing the race or ethnicity of the people that they're reviewing. So um, there's lots of workarounds, I think. And, um, you know, some, some places go to socioeconomic, um, but I think that's unfortunate because there are, you know, underrepresented um, people from underrepresented groups who are not socioeconomically disadvantaged and they still face bias and discrimination. So um, anyway, there's, if you want, <laughs> I live in this space all the time and I'm happy to talk more about that, but um, there is a way to do it. Okay. Wow. Suddenly a lot of questions. Um, and, you know, we should feel free to uh, to spend more time with you on these because <clears throat> we have just a, well, we've already done the sort of organization of breakouts, so we, we've got time. Okay, okay, okay. all right. So, um, to be successful with a training grant proposal, is it necessary to have a group of investigators with R01 funding? So, no, that's a great question. Actually, in our more quantitative ones, and I would say in particular the biostatistics ones, sometimes the faculty funding is primarily NSF. So, the, the key is that they have um, funding <laughs> because to have, you know, a baseline of active research, um, you need to have funding to do that. That's just realistic in these times, the way the academic system is set up. So if it's NSF funding, that's fine. And our review panels have been oriented not to ding people for not having NIH funding, but um, because we, you know how biostatisticians work, they don't necessarily um, are, are just working on one disease, for example, or, you know, they're, they're kind of, <laughs> no. anyway, so no, it's, it's, it's not, you don't have to have R01 funding to get a training grant. Um, do you foresee any scenarios by which NIH rules on citizenship eligibility for diversity supplements, whether those will be relaxed? So yeah, it's frustrating. It's really frustrating. The only um, mechanism that we have been able to um, change that eligibility is later in the pathway. So some of the career, like the K99R00, there's just a parent one that is individuals that K99R00, um, international um, trainees are eligible for those. And then of course, research grants, they're eligible. But I, we have not been able to crack through on the, um, the anything earlier in the pathway. And that's a congressionally mandated thing. So that's tough. 
Um, yeah, I see it's a real problem. It's a serious problem. Um, funding available for international students. So that, that was just, yeah, that would be my one comment is that we do have funding, NIH funding, but it's um, later in the pathway. And at the moment, the only way to support um, individuals is through either um, funds at the institution, research grants, it's perfectly fine for a person to put a, a training on a research grant. So that's, that's all that's available right now. Um, the brilliance comment, I remember my daughter asking when she was an upper division undergrad that in the junior senior level math class, she noted that the women in the class were all among the top students. So where were the average women? <laughs> We need to encourage at all levels. See, that's absolutely right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's an interesting, there's a really beautiful paper where they show how by discipline, how, how much the brilliance factor comes into play. So math, I think music, I'm trying to, th oh, philosophy are all of the brilliance, you know, fields. And when you look at the gender distribution, there's a perfect line. <laughs> and fortunately, biology is kind of up there in the, in the spaces where it's not thought that you need to have brilliance. So women are better represented there, but it's a really fascinating and, and it's an excellent point. Um, Claude Steele's notion of wise feedback may be particularly relevant to this group on mentoring underrepresented. Oh, okay. So somebody's, um, got a nice uh, resource for you there. Claude Steele is an amazing person and really launched an entire um, groundbreaking area in the area of stereotype threat um, and just really brilliant work. And he's got a great book, Whistling Vivaldi, if you haven't read it. Okay, I'm, another, I'm, yeah. I'm looking to see if there are any hands raised. If someone. Oh, um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I don't. Um, oh, <laughs> I like Sharon's comment there. Yeah, used as a euphemism for poor at communication. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Um, so uh, we, we stopped you. Um, oh, here's a question from yeah. Corinne. Um, can international students be... Um, unfortunately, they cannot be put on the... Um, 232 grants. They that is um, National Research Service Award. That's one of these congressionally mandated, and the oversight is that's we don't have any flexibility there at all um, for T32. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I know it's tough. Um, great. So uh, you, I know we stopped you in terms of slides. Are there things that you'd like to talk about in the additional set of slides? We, we can go on for another 10 no, minutes. No, so I mean, here. those were mostly uh, slides that I got from um, our director, Don Lorsch, that talk about some of the other things that are going on at NIGMS mm -hmm. to support um, quantitative research. And I think the one that's kind of time is the MIDAS project, you know, the modeling, and um, because they're taking such a all those researchers within that MIDAS program are um, really important for the COVID-19 um, experience. So um, yeah, that we, we find a coordinating center there. We also play a role in trying to um, help individuals get data, for example, health data, um, which is really crucial right now and it's proved problematic. And so um, NIGMS has played a, a, an important role in that. So those were the kinds of things, um, not, not anything. We have a, a, a partnership with NSF, a math bio partnership um, that I hope everybody knows about. So those are the, those are just for some of the things that I was going to add, but. Okay. Yeah. And, and I, I, I will say, as I mentioned to you, Allison, that John Lorsch has a really interesting set of data that I don't know whether it came out of your office about that NSF and IGMS partnership and uh, what it has meant in terms of success uh, on grants as follow-ups uh, for right. those that receive it. It's a really interesting. That was our data analytics folks that did that. They do a really good job on um, yeah chasing down subsequent funding and um, they can they have can capture some pretty uh, good data on uh, gender, race, ethnicity too. So it's always helpful. Yeah. 
All right. Well, I, I want to give uh, people a chance to, uh, to ask uh, other things. But while I've got you, um, I had the pleasure of uh, giving a keynote a number of years ago to the Arachta group. Oh, yeah. um, and, uh, and I was really um, uh, inspired by the interest. So uh, you, you may want to say something about that, because I bet these folks don't know. But my real question is, it seemed like it was a pretty effective way to enhance diversity uh, of um, the, the, in this case, mostly biomedical scientists, but there were certainly quantitative folks there too. And I wonder if there is any potential to expand that program because of the linkage it had with minority serving institutions and, and research institutions too. Sure, yeah, no, it's a great program. The, the basic setup is there's a partnership between a research intensive institution and one or more um, less, uh, more teaching intensive institutions and with usually with a historic mission to serving um, individuals from underrepresented groups and backgrounds. And um, the setup is that, that um, they're given this, uh, it's a pay award, but it's basically a training grant and they can recruit postdocs who come in. And the setup is that 75% of their time they spend doing research um, and 25% of their time teaching at this um, teaching intensive institution. And there's lots of, you know, ideas behind what's happening here, but it's, it's in part to give them the teaching skills so that when they transition to an academic career, they've really figured out that piece. Because as you know, once you get hit with your teaching load, your research productivity really <laughs> can take a hit um, if you're not sort of savvy about how to manage your time. And um, yes, yeah, so we had great data from that. 70% went on to academic positions. Um, the diversity was fantastic in part, particularly women and um, people from underrepresented groups. In part, it's not a, strictly speaking a diversity enhancing program, but there is other data that says that um, women and underrepresented minorities tend to um, persist longer if they have a sense of um, giving back and um, a sense of giving back to the community or giving back um, in some way. And so I think that's another important intervention that we kind of discourage on some level. We sort of say, you keep your nose to your grindstone, keep get your research done. But this is kind of proof on some level that says that the power of giving back may help people sustain their interest in staying in the pathway. So yes, it was, it's really wonderfully successful. Um, the hope is that we can, you know, there's always a finite amount of money, but um, you know, if, if ever um, we, we get a windfall and get more money there, then we would love to put more in that space because really one of the first things I did when I got there was to see that we were really dropping the ball in the postdoctoral space, even with Erecta, it just doesn't, it's not like the numbers we support in the undergraduate and the pre-doctoral space. So Mosaic is going to help with that as well, but I think we can continue to support Aracta. Mosaic and Aracta have slightly different focus. So Aracta is more kind of teaching as the skill and, and um, Mosaic is really about um, getting a research intensive position. Um, but yeah, no, it's a, it's a wonderful program. Okay. Let's see. And that, yeah, that actually ties into the question from uh, Shinhan. Uh, okay. Can you speak about the recommendations such as those the National Academy are incorporated into your funding priority condition, consideration? So, yeah, it's interesting. So there was one that um, came out on graduate education, and we actually got called out because <laughs> um, we were starting to do some of these. But I don't want to get give us credit because obviously there's a lot of um, people out there who have been talking about graduate reform and it's not like we you know concocted these ideas on our own but it is very gratifying when you see um, that it aligns with a kind of prestigious national panel and and that there's agreement that you're kind of on the right track um, the other one that there's been a few that have come out the one on mentoring I highly recommend it's really interesting and they've got a lot of nice resources with that as I mentioned we had already put a uh, um, advocated for putting significant funds into the science of mentoring um, to try to augment that and to try to really um, amplify that message. And then um, the one on sexual harassment, I don't know if you saw that one either, but that's also uh, fantastic and um, important. And um, we had been incorporating language about safe and inclusive environments for a long time, but um, we actually did 
um, put language specifically in about having policies and practices in place to handle harassment and um, discriminatory practices. And then then NIH-wide adopted that language as well. So yeah, there's, I mean, we pay attention, definitely pay attention in um, any, any way that we can try to, you know, make sure that with always with a view that is there something we could do more to really um, help um, advance certain important initiatives. Okay. So getting institutional buy-in to sustain the investments made with precious federal funds is quite difficult. Yes. As NIGMF has some ammunition for PIs of training grants for what are realistic levels of institutional buy-in. So that's a great question. We have, as I mentioned, this 10 page letter now <laughs> that we require um, that has to be signed by a, a university official. So a provost or somebody with some, uh, you know, uh, really institutional leadership position. We don't micromanage ex the exact type of what that looks like, um, but we talk about a whole range of things, um, you know, giving um, protected time for teaching and mentoring, valuing um, teaching and mentoring in tenure and promotion decisions, um, having startup funds and bridge funds to um, really advance the research training environment and to, you know, support the faculty um, it, it, with their research programs. We, we talk about a commitment to diversity and inclusion. So there's a whole range of things that we serve that, and these are just some examples, um, but uh, so it doesn't have to be cash, you know, money, <laughs> but um, there are other ways that, um, that institutions can support. And I think what, what happens is this is something of an intervention because if they have to write that letter, they have to think, Ooh, do we do that? And, are we supporting that? And so I think that it's really nice because it helps you because you can say, hey, and I, you know, they want this. <laughs> can you look at this list? Can you help, you know, and if we want a training grant and, and particularly, I think one of the things I say to that you should get together as a group of T32 principal investigators, because the power of you going to a, an official and saying, look, we may lose our, our training grants if we don't do this. And so that can really, you know, you can make us the bad guys <laughs> and then, you know, use the funding announcement as an example. And I'm happy to say again that NIH wide, they adopted our institutional letter um, as well. So now that's going to be across all T32s at NIH. So that's, that's nice. But um, I hear you, especially in these tough financial times, it's really difficult to get um, any kind of financial commitment, but. Okay. Um, so, uh, is there any, um, I'm looking here to see if there's any last, uh, uh, question comment from, from anyone. Um, just, uh, this is, yeah, uh, I think I hit them all. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. and, and Allison, you know, we, uh, certainly, uh, enjoy having you participate in as much of, of this as, as you can, uh, yeah. today and tomorrow. I, I know your time is constrained, but uh, yeah. but thank you very much uh, for uh, many many good and uh, useful sets of information about programs as well as about uh, guidance on on moving forward. Uh, Great. Yeah. Well, enjoy the meeting, and um, you know, feel free to reach out if you have any questions or um, want anything. Want me to follow up on anything? Okay. Well, um, if nothing else. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> you All right. Enjoy. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Take care. You too. All right. Okay.